Um, thanks, Ian, for asking me to give a talk here. Um, so uh, I will start with some introduction into mapping classes and pseudonyms of uh, homomorphisms, um, then tell you about Penner's construction, uh, then tell you about Penner's conjecture, and uh, hopefully uh, give you um, an idea of the proof. Uh, so. Um, <coughs> So we're interested in the mapping class group of surface S, which is uh, the set of, or the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms up to isotopy. And the basic fact uh, by Nielsen and Thurston um, is that every um, Every element of the mapping class group um, is either uh, finite order. <coughs> so you get, for instance, the way you get finite order once is you imagine a surface um, with one hole in the middle and, and several holes around and you embed it in the Euclidean space and you apply a rotation. Um, second possibility is, uh, is reducible. Reducible means that there is some collection of simple closed curves that is, that is fixed under the mapping class. Uh, a simple example for this is a, um, is a Dane twist. Um, they twist about a curve where you cut along a simple closed curve and twist it by, uh, by two pi and glue it back together. Um, but there are more complicated examples um, as well. And the third uh, most generic uh, uh, mapping class is it's called Sudanasov. which is everything else. Well, one way to characterize it is, is, is those mapping classes that don't fix any, any simple closed curve. Another way to characterize it is uh, uh, by geometry. So pseudonyms of mapping classes are those mapping classes that have, um, have a representative homomorphism that stretch the surface like a rubber band. It's like stretch in, stretch in one direction by a factor of lambda and, and compress in the other direction by one over lambda. So, um, so we have two directions and we have a stretch in one direction by lambda and the compression in the other direction by one over lambda. Um, but in general, um, there's no non vanishing line field on surfaces. So there must be singularities of these directions. So uh, there are some singular points for these, for these foliations where, where the action of the map is a little more complicated. So these are the, these two transverse foliations or transverse directions, and we have this stretching in these directions and and compressing in in these directions. Um, so this is the most general uh, class. Um, and it's non-trivial to construct such examples. There are trivial examples for these two, but, but these are not so easy. Um, so here is one possible construction. Well, Penner's construction. Um, for this, we take, um, pair of multi curves on surface so 
So let's say this is A with A1, A2, A3, and This is B, B1, B2. And then uh, we generate mapping classes by applying the twists about these individual curves. Uh, well, you um, notice that you don't always get pseudonos of mapping classes in this way. Because a twist about A3 is just a Dane twist. It's not pseudonos of. And if you, com if you conjugate a3 by some complicated word here is still a Dane twist. So you get some product of this Dane twist that's still a Dane twist. Um, so you need some restriction on how you multiply these together. Um, and it turns out that if you, if you only twist about the, the curves in A in the positive direction and twist about the curves in B in the negative direction, then um, you are always guaranteed to get pseudonos of mapping classes. Okay, so the theorem is that if A and B are filling multi-curves, well, filling means that um, the complementary regions of, of the collection of curves is a, is a union of uh, disks or once punctured disks. Um, in particular, here we have two disks, one here and one here. Um, well, if without the filling property, there is some curve that's getting fixed. So uh, in that case, we get reducibles. So uh, um, if you have a pair of filling multi-curves, then any product of T, A, I, and TBJ inverse, so that's positive the twist about AI and that's negative about BJ, is pseudonos of provided um, all twists are used at least once. Right, so really nice result that, that says that um, you take any pair of multi-curve in, in any position you want, as long as they feel there are, there are lots of combinatorial possibilities to do that. And then basically you take any product that you want with this, this restriction, then you get pseudonos of mapping classes. So <coughs> um, let me explain the idea of the, the proof, why, why this works. Um, so the idea is that, well, so the idea is, um, it goes back to Thurston, who observed that these objects, these measured foliations can be represented by measured train tracks. So, So a train track is a, well, well, it's something like that. It has switches, and it, it has edges. And uh, um, at each switch, um, the edges come uh, in two directions and smooth way. And, and uh, you have some genius, and it goes all around. And, um, yeah. So, so th what's the connection here? The connection is that um, if you have a measured foliation, you can, you, can, you can puncture the foliation here. And also, um, let's look at the red foliation here. And also, you remove these, these leaves coming from, um, coming from that singularity. And you blow air here that's, um, <coughs> um, that, um, <coughs> that will make the, the foliation part sort of contract onto, um, onto like thin parts uh, that you can just collapse onto edges. And, and that gives you uh, a train track. 
if, if, if that makes any sense. Or in the, in the reverse way, if you, if you have a train track and you put some um, non-negative numbers uh, on the edges, and at each, uh, well, satisfying the switch conditions so that this number is that plus that, and you put three amount of stuff here and two amount of stuff here and one amount of stuff here, then everything uh, matches up nicely. Um, so you get the measured foliation in a neighborhood of the train track, and then you can just collapse the, the complement through regions, and then you get the foliation on the, on the closed surface. Um, so the idea is to, uh, to find this invariant measured foliation um, as, a, as a train track. And so this invariant measured foliation, or this invariant train track, is obtained by, by smoothing out the intersections. So say the, the yellow curve uh, stays the same, but the, the red curve is has changed a little in a way um, that the smoothings are consistently oriented, meaning that anytime you go along um, a yellow curve in either direction um, and you and you hit an intersection, then um, then the the yellow one continues in the right direction and the 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 red one continues in the left direction. okay, and you can always do that. Um, and this train track has the nice property that if you apply, for instance, uh, TA1, so the twist about A1, then what happens um, is, well, so this twist only changes, only changes B1, because that's the only curve that this curve is intersecting in a non-trivial way. Um, so what happens is um, B1, B1 changes like, like that. But, but this curve um, can be homotopian to this train track in a nice, smooth way. So uh, what this says, and we can do a similar thing on, for the red curves if, if it is in the other direction. So this means that um, if I have some product psi, then uh, psi uh, induces a train track map on, on this train track tau. Okay, what's a train track map? Well, a train track map is just a self map over the train track that maps the vertices to vertices and edges into, into some edge paths. Um, so once I have a train track map, I can, I can write down a transition matrix, say the edge transition matrix. Um, that describes how many times um, an edge path is mapping to a certain edge. Okay, so for each pairs, each pair of edge, you can you can say how many times an image of this edge is mapping to another edge, and this is some non-negative matrix with integral entries. So, um, and Penner shows that this is a Perron-Frobenius matrix. Uh, which means that some power of it has strictly positive coordinates. So, so it has a Perron-Frobenius eigenvalue or an eigenvector. Um, uh, so, so this is a this is a vector with strictly positive entries, um, and this corresponds to a, a measure on the edges. 
Uh, so each, each coordinate of this eigenvector tells you some number that you can write on the edges, and it's going to be a measure. And uh, as we discussed over there, a measure on, on the train check gives us a measured foliation. <coughs> And it turns out to be the uh, is one of these invariant invariant measured foliations. Um, right, because the the uh, the parent for being is eigenvalue, so the eigenvalue corresponding to this eigenvector um, is going to be this stretch vector. So it, 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 it stretches this, this foliation exactly by uh, that factor lambda. Um, so this parent for Benius eigenvalue is the stretch factor. Right. Um, so there's the idea behind the construction. Construction? Oh yeah. So Thurston's construction, uh, you still have a pair of filling multi-curves, uh, but in Thurston's construction, you um, well, in that case, the products that you're allowed to mm, create are any product of TA1, TA2, TA3 with, with some powers. So any product of this and TB1 to Q1 and TB2 to, to Q2. OK, so here I, you, can, you, can, you can take negative powers of these as well, you can take you can you, you can look at the subgroup generated by this. While this is here, it's only the monoid generated by these two. Um, and here, well, not everything is um, is pseudo Nossov. You get the pseudo Nossov as long as the um, a certain matrix uh, in SL two Z is uh, is hyperbolic. So. It's, so Thurston's construction is more restrictive in in the, in the sense that you you're, you're required to put these TAI next to each other, and you, you always have to use this combination of them. Um, but it's um, the Penner's construction is more restrictive that it, it does not allow negative powers for this and positive powers for the other. Um, so they have an intersection. Uh, um, which is non-empty. Right. Um, so one observation is that not every pseudonus of map arises from Penner's construction, uh, because it turns out that the uh, well each complementary region corresponds to a singularity. Um, so so here each each cusp that you see at the train tracks, these four cusps down here, corresponds to a, a leaf emanating from the singularity. So, so there is some four prong singularity here, and there is some four prong singularity here, and. Well, intuitively, when, when you just do the Dane twist here at these curves, the, the regions are not permuted. So the singularities are not permuted between each other. So the, the mapping classes, the pseudonosophs that you get from this construction always fix all the singularities. However, there are pseudonosoph maps that permute the singularities non-trivially. So, so it's not true that everything arises this way. Um, but you can maybe hope that some some, some power of uh, the pseudonos of uh, so you, you maybe hope that any pseudonos of map 
arises as a power of some something like this. Oh no, so, sorry, the other way. So you, yeah, you, you, you may hope that every, every pseudonus of math has a power that arises this way. And this was Penner's conjecture. So you can, you can ask uh, this question for e each finite type surface. Given, given a surface, is it true that every pseudonus of map has a power that arises uh, this way? And uh, well, some of the simple surfaces, the, well, SGN is the surfaces genus G and N punctures. So S00, S01, and S02, and S03. Well, they are not interesting because they have no pseudonosos. The first interesting examples are S10 and S11 and S04. Um, so the tor is the once punctured torus and the four times punctured sphere. Um, and these examples have essentially the same mapping class group and um, essentially the same pseudonoso maps. Um, and um, it was sort of folklore theorem that here the, the conjecture is true. Um, we, get, we get everything from Penner's conjecture, Penner's construction. Um, and the, the theorem with Hyun Shik Shin is that. Uh, the conjecture is false for, for all the other surfaces. So it's false if 3G plus N is at least 5. Um, and uh, and the theorem follows from the following, uh, following observation um, that, um, well, let me introduce the definition first. So, uh, so pseudonos of map psi and its stretch vector. Lambda is called coronal if lambda has a gala conjugate on the unit circle. Coronal. Um, so Like, right. Um, so, uh, so the theorem is that uh, um, coronal pseudonos of mapping classes. Cannot arise from Penner's construction. Um, so, uh, so if a map, if a pseudon also is coronal, then all its powers are also coronal. Because if, if, if a number has a Galois conjugate in a unit circle, then all its powers also have Galois conjugates on the unit circle. So, um, 
So this takes care of the theorem once, once we show that coronal pseudo-anosovs exist on all those surfaces. Um, and, and that's not hard to do. Um, if you look at the literature about the, the, the minimal stretch factor uh, pseudo-anosovs, almost all of them are coronal. So all you need to do is you just lift those examples to higher genus surfaces and puncture surfaces, and, and you, get, uh, you get coronal examples on, on everything. Um, so, um, so I will try to prove this, uh, this theorem in the rest of the time. So, uh, so we will use, you will use these transition matrices that I described here. So the observation is that uh, to study these stretch factors, we only need to um, write down these matrices and study their, their eigenvalues. Okay, and, and we can write down these transition matrices very explicitly. So uh, let's look at uh, the day and twist about A1. And uh, well, I have, I have four curves here, so uh, my transition matrix is going to be some uh, five curves, so it's a five by five matrix, where I label the columns and the rows by the curves. And then, so, uh, um, and so each, curve is corresponding to, uh, well, A1 is, for instance, A1 corresponds to this vector, A2 corresponds to the one with 0, 1, and so on. So um, to, to, to write down this matrix, all I need to look at is um, what the images of the curves are. So if I twist about A1, then A1 doesn't go anywhere. So this vector should uh, go to this vector uh, to, to the same vector. So the first column is is that. Now uh, B1 is mapped somewhere else, but all the other curves are also just mapped to themselves. So other than the column of B1, uh, the matrix is the identity. And what happens with B1? Well. When I twist uh, B1 about A1, then this is the curve I get. And uh, um, this is, in this train track, this is A1 plus B1. OK, so what I get is, um, is this vector. Uh, that's the image of, image of B1. So um, I named this matrix Q1. So this is the transition matrix corresponding to the day twist about A1. Um, and similarly, we can write down all the others. So uh, generally, the formula is the following. Um, well, you can notice that the only thing that we used to figure out the entries here is how many times e the pair of curves intersects. Nothing else, nothing about the combinatorics or the geometry of the picture. So. If I, um, let me write this here. So if omega is my intersection matrix, um, so A1 intersects only B1 and nothing else. A2 intersects B1, B1 and B2 and nothing else and so on. So, um, so this is the intersection matrix <coughs> of A and B. Um, then, um, and if if D I is this matrix that has only one non-zero entry on the diagonal, so everything else is zero. And, and this 
1 is in the ith row and ith column, and then the formula for the qi is i plus di omega. So what this formula is saying, just take the 5 by 5 ident identity matrix and add the i row of the intersection matrix. And that's, that's how you get uh, these, these matrices. So then, uh, so then uh, one of the, the pseudonyms of the stretch factors, so the pseudonyms of stretch factor uh, is just the, uh, the pair of Frobenius eigenvalue of some product of of these matrices is QI. So, um, so just one more notation. I'm going to denote by gamma of omega the, the monoid generated by the QI. OK, so what I need to prove is um, what I need to prove is the following. Um, if M is a is an element of such a monoid, then M doesn't have eigenvalues on the unit circle. Well, this is almost true. But of course, the identity is, is in there, which has eigenvalues in unit circle. But it's enough to say that. Um, Except for except one. So the only eigenvalue they can have on the unit circle is one. So it will follow. Um, right. So uh, so this will follow because because these are integral poly integral matrices. So the stretch vector is root of the characteristic polynomial. So all the Galois conjugates of the stretch vector are roots or eigenvalues of these matrices. Um, um, so the idea is, uh, is a little bit um, related to dynamical systems, um, where if you, um, well, the observation is that um, an eigenvalue in the unit circle corresponds to a rotation on some uh, invariant plane. So suppose um, that it's false, then, um, then we have some invariant plane. Where um, on which n acts by some rotation, um, and so we want to rule out such rotations, um, and so the idea comes from um, dynamical systems where you, if you have some dynamical system and you want to prove that <coughs> you want to prove that this point is a stable equilibrium point, then you can take some convex function that has the minimum at that point and show that after every iteration, the value at that point is going to be smaller and smaller. If you do that, then you can't escape that area. So it's a little bit different here because we're not proving stability. We're trying to prove instability. Or un un yeah, instability. So what we show is there's some analogous height function where after every iteration, the height increases. 
So if you keep increasing the height, then of course you can't come back to the same place. So the statement is that there exists uh, h, well in this case from r5 to r, so this measures on the edges, um, such that the height of an iterate of any vector under a QI is at least the height of, uh, of the vector. So, uh, so if I have that, once again, here's the picture. Here's the height of this point, and then I apply the rotation, and it gets higher. And again, it gets higher, higher. And then in the last step, um, that's a contradiction because it can't go lower. Of course, the only thing that can go wrong is if, if, if it's, there's inequality here, not strict inequality. But it turns out that uh, equality holds if and only if uh, the vector v is not moving. So anytime v is moving, the height increases. So if, the, if this was a non-trivial rotation, then uh, even if it's an irrational rotation, well, this function is continuous. So even if it's an irrational rotation, uh, it's a counterexample. So, so what is this height function? Um, that's the only missing part. Let's look at one simple scenario where, um, where this height function can be figured out pretty explicitly. So let's take a torus um, in these two curves. So in that case, the um, intersection matrix is 0, 1, 1, 0. So my Q1 is 1, 1, 0, 1. My Q2 is 1, 0, 1, 1. So uh, these Q1 and Q2 act on the plane. Uh, one of them acts by shearing this way. The other one acts by shearing this way. So if I want a function that, that, that is increasing in the direction of the arrows, uh, there has to be a mountain here and a mountain here and some valley here and some valley here. Um, so the easiest such function is some quadratic form uh, that has a saddle here. So h x y equals x times y does the job. Right, if you replace x by x plus y, or if, if you replace y by x plus y, it's, you add some square. So it, it always goes up. Um, and the amazing thing is that uh, the, this, um, this function, this height function in the general case, well, it's also given by a quadratic form. And this quadratic form is defined precisely by, um, by the intersection matrix. OK. Um, in particular, uh, the difference between the height of the image of a vector and the height of the original vector is the squared Euclidean norm uh, of their difference, which also shows that if if these are different, then the height indeed increases. Um, so proving this is just a few lines based on the definitions. Um, well, the interesting question that we don't know the answer to is. Is what does this what does this H mean geometrically, and what's the geometric explanation that it always increases? 
So we have a linear algebra to prove that it also increases, but it, it would be very satisfying to see something, uh, some geometric explanation. <laughs> well, um, one way to consider uh, the height is the following. So, um, right, so. Uh, So, so vector, so vector is just an assignment of numbers um, to these edges. So let's let's say I write some numbers here. That is my vector, and then so this this formula is saying that the way to calculate the height of such a um, such a vector is that you should look at each intersection. And at each intersection, you should multiply the two numbers that's written on the two curves and, and add the, all these up together. Um, so h is the sum of products at the intersections. It sounds like some kind of uh, signed area in the general case. Uh, well, there is this general construction that whenever you have a filling pair of multi-curves, um, you, can, you can put a vertex in each region. And, and to each edge uh, uh, in, in this graph, you can construct this dual uh, this dual edge, and if you, if you draw all the edges, you get a square tiling of the surface. So, um, so then this height, you can say that this height measures the signed area of that that um, that square rectangle tight surface where the widths of the rectangles are these numbers. But what's hard to uh, mm, Imagine is what happens if there are negative weights here. What, what, what does it mean that the cylinder has negative widths? And also, even if all the widths are positive, and even if um, I consider this height as an area, then what's the reason that if I'm applying this, this Dane twist, then the height always increases? So we, we, don't, we don't know the answer. Um, Yeah, even even if the even if the weights are positive, we don't know a geometric explanation for why the height increases. Yeah. Um, so so you may wonder uh, then how many uh, pseudonyms are there that are coronal and how many are not coronal. So how many do arise from Penrose construction and how many don't? So, so first of all, we don't know if, if this is the only obstruction for arising from Penner's construction. So another question is, um, are there non-coronal pseudonyms that, who's, that <coughs> also don't have a power. Um, um, and the other question that you may wonder is, uh, like how many coronal pseudonosophs there are. Um, well, Nathan Dunfield and Giulio Tiozzo um, did some computer experiments 
where Nathan just told me about today that uh, that so they did uh, random walks in the mapping class group on uh, in braided groups, so mapping class groups in the, of the puncture disks, and uh, they observed that for every for a fixed surface, some fixed there's, there seems to be some fixed percentage of the pseudo-NOSOFs that they get that is coronal, and some fixed percentage that's not. And this fixed percentage uh, changes um, as you change the underlying surface. Um, so um, I, I don't know if they have a large enough sample size to say anything definite, but it would be really interesting if uh, if the percentage, sort of the percentage of coronal versus non-coronal pseudonosophs would be strictly between 0 and 100%. Um, it also have more eigenvalues than the circle, right? And you can they have one, yes. you can have many, like if there's no. Yes, yes. Um, um, yeah, I think, I, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>